So I'm here to speak about the uh, information session with respect to the paralegal program for UCI. And I have a panel of uh, alumni here from the paralegal program that want to talk to you as well. They're working paralegals and they're going to talk to you about the day in the life of what it is they do. We'll talk about other different topics. But again, what better way to not only learn about our program, but to also talk to alumni um, that have gone through our program. So this is a, the way in which we like to do this for you. So let's get started with some introductions. And again, this will be what we'll talk about today. We'll do some introductions and uh, we'll have a panel discussion with respect to the alumni here. And we'll talk about the program in general, which I'm sure you wanna know about. And then we'll have some Q&A. So also along the way, if you do have questions, make sure you drop them in the uh, Q&A that we have there uh, for you to, in order to be able to answer those questions. And Vicki, will you be looking at that for me tonight? I know you- Yep, got it covered. Awesome. So let's start with some introductions of our esteemed panel. We'll start with you first, Nick. Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Gazowski. I've been a paralegal now for five years, somewhere around there. Um, I've worked at a couple of different law firms and a couple of different corporations and happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Courtney, how about you? Hi, everyone. My name's Courtney Counts, and I am brand new to this field. Um, I've been working as a paralegal, as a junior paralegal for the past six months. And prior to that, um, I had some great internships. But yeah, I'm just starting off my career. And so far, it's been great. Awesome. Hey. Hi, uh, my name is Vicki LaSalle. I am um, a paralegal by education and a manager of legal operations in the legal department at a company called Beckman Coulter. I've been doing this for uh, many, many more years than um, the two prior to me, but um, probably coming up, I, I'm always like right behind Kai. So I don't think I'm ever gonna catch up to her until she retires, <laughs> but I'm excited to talk to you guys. I'm awesome. also the instructor here in the program too. Great, Lorena. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorena Hughes, and I've worked as a criminal law paralegal for about 16 years now. I've worked on many cases, anywhere from lower level misdemeanor offenses to higher level felony offenses, where the consequences can include prison time. And I have been fortunate enough over the years to have participated in unique experiences and opportunities in this area of law. And, and I also teach the criminal law course with uh, UCI, which is something I just started doing this year. Awesome. And uh, my name is Kai Williamson, and I'm one of the instructors here as well. Uh, I've been here for almost 18 years. And um, my, by trade, my regular nine to five job is I'm a senior paralegal and director of corporate governance for a company called Alorca Inc., which we'll talk about more. And I'm not sure if Gina has joined us. Gina is the program director. Or Gina, are you there? Introduce yourself. If not, we can move on. But if you are, make sure you open up and tell everybody who you are. But we'll move on and we'll let you, if you're there, you're there. If not, if not. All righty, guys. So um, the presentation goal, again, is to talk to you about why you want to, make, want to become a paralegal. We'll talk about the job industry, the job market, the, the actual raw numbers of what's going on in the industry right now. And also, you're here because you're interested in UCI's paralegal program. And there are many to choose from. And we're happy that you're here to learn about UCI's paralegal program. So we'll make sure we break that down to you tonight. So uh, let's see here. I'm trying to go to my next slide. So why become a paralegal? To become a valued legal professional, work in a variety of practice areas, have a great salary, job opportunities, because the job opportunities are there. And then many of you may have um, your goal on going to law school, ultimately going to law school. Maybe you want to land at the paralegal uh, world for a little bit and maybe ultimately go to law school. We do have a lot of paralegal profes uh, professionals and paralegal colleagues of all of ours that have done that. They moved on from being a paralegal maybe after five, six years, and then they went to law school. So it is possible. So the panelist perspective, let's talk a little bit to the panelists and let's hear about some of their uh, experiences or whatever. Start with you, Courtney. So what does a typical day look like for you now that you've been six months uh, <laughs> working at the law firm that you work, well, work at? Yeah, um, like Kai mentioned, and I did as well, I'm pretty new to this. So it has only been six months, but 
I feel that right now I work in insurance defense and um, we have a lot of different carriers. We work for dozens and dozens of carriers. So every day is different depending on what I'm doing. A lot of what we do is with the discovery. So we respond to discovery and we request discovery. Um, I do subpoenas almost every day. We do a lot of different types of medical and claim file summaries, um, any kind of like privilege log or redaction work that needs to be done for something that we're producing. So yeah, I do a little bit of this and that every day. Um, it's really fun. I really, really like it. I'm so grateful to be in the position I'm at because I feel that with all the different carriers we have, all the cases are really different. So at the firm I'm at, I don't see myself getting bored here because it's new literally every day. So I really enjoy it so far. Awesome. And we'll get back to you. We have lots of questions for you, uh, Courtney, and maybe someone that's listening has questions for you as well. But let's stick along with someone that's coming from the law firm environment. Lorena, tell us what a typical day would look like for you in the law firm environment. Well, typically, there is no typical day. So every... <laughs> Every day is certainly different and priorities can change depending on what's going on. So one day can be a mix of me communicating with clients. The client communication is an everyday thing, no matter what, but it could be also along with that, I might be reviewing new evidence or just evidence in general that has been received for any particular case. Maybe it's reviewing law enforcement videos. Another day can be a mix of, again, talking to clients and then spending the second part of the day preparing paperwork and motions that will need to be filed soon. And it's all about prioritizing and reprioritizing based on court deadlines. Um, and then on another day, I might be joining an attorney in court. And that could be for a number of reasons. And one of them can be because we're engaged in, in trial. Wow. Well, like you said, there's not a typical day in, in, in your world of, of criminal defense. So um, Vicki and Nick, but we'll start with you, Nick, and also myself. So the next three, we're going to talk about a typical day. However, we we all worked in law firms, but we now work in the legal department of a corporation, which is called working in-house. So we're going to talk to you from uh, Nick. I want you to start with your law firm experience and then go to your in-house experience. All right. So my law firm days were a little further back, but... Um, usually what would happen is I would pull up the calendar at the beginning of the day, try to figure out what the filing deadlines are. If we had anything that should have been filed the day before, just following up on that. And then a lot of it was working on court forms, um, getting filings ready for the court, working on discovery responses. Um, sorting through discovery that we would get from either outside counsel or the other side. Um, and that was pretty much it. I know that when you work in a law firm, a lot of it is going to be discovery heavy and it's going to be very in depth with how you interact with the courts. Whereas now that I am in house, I don't have to do much of that. Um, my day usually starts, I try to break it up because I do litigation and contracts. So I try to get all my litigation done at the beginning of the day. Um, but that mostly consists of checking reports, getting status updates on the cases. I no longer have to file things with the court. I just get copies in the mail, which they should be emailing by now, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. But Doing that, working with outside counsel, sending them the documents so that they can sort through it instead of me. And then ultimately processing things like settlement checks, um, new claims that come in. And then the second half of my day is usually devoted to contracts. Um, I work at a dental company, so there's a lot of sales agreements. There's a lot of marketing agreements. There's a lot of NDAs for suppliers, and so that's, that's how I end and my what day. what does NDA mean in, in case someone on the call doesn't understand that terminology, legal terminology? Oh, sorry. Um, so an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement, and it basically just means that I'm going to be telling you a secret. It's your duty to keep it secret. 
you could be telling me one as well, but whatever we talk about has to stay confidential and between us. Very cool. Awesome. So again, we'll get back to you, Nick. Vicki, how about you? Go for it. Tell us what a typical day, and now you don't have to go back to your law firm days. You can stay straight corporate, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, currently now my day is, it's it can be very interesting. I have worked for a global company and I work with folks in all different areas of the world, regions of the world. So there are some days I may have a call or a virtual meeting at 6 a.m. Um, other days, I may not even have any meetings that morning and I just start when I'm ready to start. Um, I'm a manager now and um, so I have some folks that report to me, but typically I come in, you know, I'm checking what I have to do for that day. I may be working on a project. Um, I'm obviously going to be providing support to my um, administrative assistant, the paralegals that support that report to me. Um, sometimes the attorneys have questions. I do a lot of contracts like Nick does. I work for a medical device company. So again, lots of um, business there, all business driven by contracts. I also support litigation. I also um, help do the um, back-end administration of our contract lifecycle management system. Um, and yeah, I, I I could go on and on about my day, but I, I will do that for you guys in some class in the future. So um, yeah, I just, you know what? I do what needs to be done. That's awesome. legit. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, guys, just, uh, just quickly, a typical day uh, for me, I am in it just like, Vicky, I'm an international corporate paralegal, so I form companies globally. So um, again, the, I was saying the last year I formed a company in Poland, Egypt, South Africa, Uruguay, Paraguay, um, and um, did I say South Africa, and I did something else recently, UK, the United Kingdom. So I form, and what it is is the executives in the company. Uh, and again, we remember we. In-house means you work at a corporation. So imagine working for Apple, Google, Facebook, a company like that. And your legal team, you work with the, the executives. So the CEO says, hey, we want to expand what it is that we do in this region of the world. And so the corporate legal team has to handle that. And I happen to be the corporate legal team for the company that I work for. I am the only corporate person. There isn't even a corporate attorney. I am the corporate. Uh, but again, I do have a boss. My, my chief legal officer is my attorney, but he is not. He's a litigator. He's not a corporate. But again, uh, whenever the executives want to form or do something or, or expand the brand in another region, I'm the one who sets up shop in that region. And I work with local counsel, the local lawyers in that respective country. I will work with them to get the job done. And again, just like Vicki, I love my job. And um, and again, it's you know, every day is different, just like with um, um, Lorena was saying every day is different. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen every from day to day. I actually had a call at 6 a.m. this morning. Uh, that's when my day started, but it was at the end of the day for the Philippines. I had a call with the Philippines this morning on something that was going on. So again, that's a typical day for me. So how about we talk about, let's go to the, uh, Courtney, Philip Flowers. Do you do Philip Flowers or not? So I am really fortunate. We do have billable hours, but starting off in my position, my firm is super generous. So the first year, we don't have a billable hour minimum or anything like that, which is amazing because billable hours are tough, especially where I come from. I did a brief stint for six months prior to this in criminal law. So for billable hours, you're basically billing stating exactly what you're doing for the client. And when I was in criminal law, we could bill essentially whatever we were doing because your client is one person or a couple of people. Where I work now, um, our clients are these big companies like Geico, Allstate, State Farm. So they're very specific about how they bill. They're all different. They have different guidelines and those guidelines change constantly, which is why they are so generous to give us a year to learn how to bill um, because it is worlds different than when I was in criminal law. I'm like, billable hours aren't that bad. And then I came here. I'm like, what is this? So yeah, billable hours can be tough depending, I think, on the firm you're at and the type of work you're doing. 
And guys, just so you understand that the whole billable hour concept, and again, you may have seen it in movies or some of you on the call may even know about it, but billable hours, this is a paralegal and attorney concept. And any client that comes in, we're talking law firm, any client that comes in, anything, regardless of you uh, accepting the retainer agreement or whatever, any time you touch a client file, you or the attorney touch a client file, you get to bill for whatever it is you do. Phone calls, drafting letters, uh, you know, going to court, whatever it is, you get to bill how much time you spend and you do it in six minute increments. And it can, for paralegals, I know my billable rate when I worked in a law firm setting for the first seven years of my career, my billable rate was 1650. If I build 1650 hours between January 1st and December 31st of any given year, I would I would get a $10,000 bonus for doing that, but it, it basically that target was over my head to make those billables in order to get that $10,000 bonus. So billables do come with nice bonuses. Now again, we're paralegals. Can you imagine the bonus structure for attorneys? And attorneys though, they have if I had as a paralegal to bill 1650, you can imagine the attorneys are, especially at partner level, they're, they're building like 2,500 a year or something like that. And it can be hard. It's not necessarily easy, especially if the work is not there. So keep that in mind. That's something that other classes, when if you come into our program, we'll be talking about the whole billable hour concept. You'll have uh, homework assignments related to it, but it's something that you will be doing in a law firm setting. Uh, you can't get around it. And so keep that in mind. All righty, uh, Nick, anything to add about the whole billable hours? You're uh, you're the only one that outside of, you know, uh, I know that uh, Lorena didn't have billable hours in the law firm, even though she was there. But Nick, I know you did. Anything you want to add before I move on from billable hours? Um, no, I think, I think they look scary. And it's nice that Courtney's firm actually gives you that year of lead time to That's get into awesome. it. But once you get into it, it does get easier. It just gets a little tedious. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, it's accounting for your day. It's accounting for your day and it, and it can, it's definitely tedious for sure. So um, Vicki, would you say, and again, someone at your level, you know, being a paralegal, you know, almost 30 years or so, would you say that paralegal attorneys consider us very valuable? And if so, how, why, like, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yes. Attorneys definitely consider us value provided that we bring value to the company, the practice, the law firm, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, if you're a good, strong, you know, you're doing your job, you're um, you, working through your assignments, you're bringing value to that law firm or to that in-house legal department, you know, with a law firm that translates directly into the firm getting paid through um, your billable hours that you're going to be charging clients for. Um, and yeah, I would say attorneys definitely find paralegals valuable in house. We don't have bill billable hours. Legal departments are also often looked at as a cost center where the work we're doing is a cost. It's an expense for the company. We're not bringing in revenue typically. So, um, in that regard, paralegals can be very valuable because there's a lot of work that we can do at a far lower salary than a lot of your attorneys would get paid. Um, so that's a big value with paralegals for attorneys. And, and to be honest, in my experience, um, you know, I've, I've partnered up with so many different attorneys throughout my years and every single one of them has always found me valuable and really do want my opinion on different matters and different, you know, contracts, things like that. Sometimes the, I will tell you right now with our non-disclosure agreements at our company, if the attorneys are asked about getting a non-disclosure agreement, they immediately refer that business person over to our paralegal and just say he is the expert on non-disclosure agreements. You'll need to talk to him about it. So the value is definitely there and they see it. Absolutely. Courtney, what would you say about that being a new paralegal uh, in the practice, do you see that that your attorneys value you even with you know the the experience level you have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, very grateful for it coming in here and being new, but they've given me some really substantial projects right off the bat. Um, so yeah, I definitely think they value the paralegals and they they definitely ask a lot from them. But it's rewarding, too, to feel that you're actually putting in all the substantial work. 
Lorena, I saved this last this question for you, but I wanted to talk to you last about this because I know how valuable you were to uh, uh, your uh, attorney that you worked for, but just kind of give us a little snippet of things with, with respect to that question. Yeah, well, like Vicki was saying, it is all about the value that you bring to a firm. So one of the first things that I learned when I first started uh, working as a paralegal is you always want to think about how you can save the attorney's time or how you can save them money. Because in business, it's always about time or money. So once you invest your or time as a paralegal, which is also valuable. A person's time is, is very valuable. Once you invest your time into becoming an expert in whatever it is that your firm or company does, it will get noticed. So if you're either saving time or money, that's how you start earning bonuses and earning raises and beautiful things like that. Absolutely. So um, classes, we'll start with Courtney first, but Courtney, could you take us back? Because again, it's been the shortest amount of time for you. You graduated this time last year uh, from yeah. the program, from the paralegal program. But look for the students that are the potential students that are on this call. What should they, you know, that what would you want to let them know with respect to classes they need to take seriously, or or that you know, and, and again, I know you took everything seriously, but again, you get my point of this question, yeah. but. <laughs> Well, true. A lot of them are really important, but I think a lot of it comes down to what type of law or paralegal work you're looking to do and go into. Um, for me personally, I think the most beneficial classes, I really enjoy corporate law and legal writing. I get to do um, a lot of writing where I'm at, where I'm privileged. My firm is set up, all firms are set up really differently. And as you'll go through this program, you'll kind of learn that at some firms, they look at like legal assistants and paralegals the same way. And at my firm, we have legal clerks, legal assistants, and the paralegals. So the clerks and assistants do all of our form work. They do all of our filing. They do all of our calendaring. Like anything that's a form wise, we don't touch, which means the paralegals are left to actually draft things, which is what I love doing. So the legal writing class for me was great. And the professor at the time was he was really approachable and always got back to you and made extra office hours. So that was one of my favorite classes that I feel that has really helped me so far in my job and really made an effect on my work so far. Very cool. So uh, Nick, what about you? What 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 helped you along the way? And, and again, I know that you've been in-house now for two years, but you've actually been, you but you were in a law firm for like almost four, right? Because it's been about a good six going on seven years that you've been a paralegal. Am I right? I think it was, it was like two and a half at a firm. I think two and a half in-house, okay. somewhere around there. Gotcha. <laughs> so what would you say for that uh, question? What should they take seriously? If you're going to go the law firm route, um, I think legal writing would probably be the best way to go. However, if you want to go in-house, um, Contracts would be the number one class because no matter what you do, what you want to do, the systems you use, anything you want to do is going to have a contract attached to it. And so if you want to go in-house, you'd be surprised at how many contracts there actually are. Right. Especially if you're working in particular specialty areas like medical mm -hmm. or, or something like that. There's a lot of contracts related to that. Um, Ski, what would you t what would you tell? Uh, what classes should they be pay attention to? Are you asking me or Nick? Yeah. Oh, me. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm gonna look at this a little differently. I agree completely with everything Courtney and Nick said. Um, really think about kind of where you want to go, where you want to work, and that may kind of sh dictate what kind of classes you may want to take. I was very interested in litigation when I first started, so I obviously took the litigation classes, legal writing, legal research, um, really important for that. <clears throat> but I'm going to take a step back. And if you're not sure what area of law you want to go into, I would really take your fundamentals class seriously because that's really going to show you all the different, you know, the variety of you know areas of law that you can practice in and really give you a flavor a taste a little you know a mouche bouge for each one of these different types of 
um, areas of law that you could actually be a paralegal um, and practice in that area. So I would say take that one seriously. It's probably one of the funner classes you're going to take. Um, I haven't taken any of the classes in a while, but it's it's a more of a low key. You have multiple guest speakers um, and it's really interesting to learn these different areas of law. But legal reading, writing, you have to know how to write well. So that's very important. And then depending on where you want to go, you know, legal research is always a good thing, but, you know, contracts, litigation, whatever that may be, but that fundamentals class, and, you know, I do have a little, you know, investment in that. Um, that's a good one, I think, to, to really, you know, focus on and, and pay attention to. Absolutely. And just so you guys know, that is a required course in the paralegal program. And that is the first course that you take if you sign up, especially if you sign up for the summer, that would be the first course that you would take. So you will start to get a look into the paralegal program through that first class that you would take. All righty, uh, Lorraine, anything to add there? And it, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I agree with what everybody already said. Um, but just to add to that, one of the, one of the um, because I had already started working in criminal law when I started the program and I really started liking it, I decided to take one of my all time favorite classes. I believe it's an elective is torts and yeah. that there's a lot of parallels that go that run between criminal law and torts because um, it's all about litigation. Right. So there's criminal litigation and then there's civil law litigation within civil law. There are tons of different types of civil laws. But what I liked about that class that I was able to apply for criminal law, which was what I had already been uh, working in, is that any cause of action has elements. And so you get a, a certain fact pattern. And so um, on the criminal side, I'm getting st people's stories of like what happened. I'm getting their facts kind of from the get go. So I'm already analyzing, wor working years in this area, I'm already analyzing and and figuring out the elements to a particular crime. But I, I learned all about those elements and how to apply them on the civil side with the tort laws, right? Because again, every cause of action has their elements. So then you start applying that, those, that, that fact pattern into those elements that you need to fulfill in order to determine whether or not you actually have a cause of action. And same thing with the criminal law, every crime has the different elements. And so that's how you, begins to analyze different cases, even as they first come in. To, right. You can start determining from the get-go whether or not you actually have a case and then where you can start attacking it. And then of course the case progresses throughout the litigation process. But I would say that's one of the reasons why torts was one of my all-time favorite classes. Because so Lorraine, I wanna stick with you with respect to your background. Cause again, I think of probably a lot of the people here on the call, they, they have, other areas that they're in and they decided that they want to lean into law, lean, you know, and whether it be the paralegal or the law school route. You came from a different area and, and decided that you wanted to be a paralegal. Tell us about that background that you were in and, and why you decided to become take take the paralegal class at UCI and, and ultimately become a paralegal. Yeah, so um, I orig originally worked in a completely different career before I entered the legal field. I was in mostly like business management, hospitality, hotel, restaurant management. I had left my last job in that career once I was ready to move on to do something completely different. Like I just, I needed something different and the law was always something of interest. So I decided to enroll into UCI's paralegal certificate program. And while I was taking classes, through, I, I didn't really know where I was going to land in the area of law at all while I was taking classes. I just knew that I wanted to be in this, this um, realm through UCI. Then um, I quickly learned how uh, networking was very important. So as I'm taking these classes, I'm talking, I'm starting to talk to people. I don't know anybody. And then through a friend of a friend of a friend, I was asked if I'd be interested in working for a criminal defense attorney at that time. Her name is Virginia Landry, and she's looking for help at our office. And at that time, I had no experience, but I interviewed with her, and she liked that, well, first, that I was enrolled in this certificate program, and then also that I had certain skills that she needed at the office at the time, including I had a strong background in training and hiring, and I also spoke Spanish, so I had the ability to interpret for her Spanish-speaking clients. And so those were 
transferable skills that helped me get my foot in the door and then move on and learn the paralegal skills that I continued to learn through the work experience. And then as the years went on, I really grew to enjoy the area more and more. And I met lots of people and other attorneys working through that practice. I had considered law school at the time, but I really loved what I was was doing. I was learning. I was just I was learning so much every day. I'm still learning so much every day. But today I'm mainly doing contract work and project work for some of those same attorneys that I got to know really well over the years. Um, and then, of course, I also teach the criminal law course at UCI. So it was a, um, a, a it was a progression, I guess, if you want to call it call it that. But I didn't really know what I was going to do from the beginning, but here I am. Awesome. Anyone else here on this call uh, considered law school? Anyone else besides Lorena? She kind of led us into that last question about law school. Because again, I'm sure a lot of you on the uh, call may be interested in law school. We know UCI has its law school right next to paralegal school. And some of you guys may think, oh, if I do the paralegal, uh, I have a better chance of law school. Not necessarily, but you know, it could help. <laughs> but anyone else considered law school or maybe considering law school? I, I considered it for a hot minute and um, went through the paralegal program. And once I got done and started working for the attorneys, I just found out I really enjoy what I, I'm doing and everything I've been doing since then. So I had no real need or desire to go to law school. And I were started out in the law firm. So I really didn't want the liability that comes with that when you um, are an attorney. Nick, how about you? I think before I started being a started paralegal school, I wanted to go and be an attorney. And then I think the more I learned, um, the more I actually want to like vacation and have a work life balance. And I feel like a lot of attorneys don't get that privilege. So my work will pay for it. Cool. But other than that, I think I'm good. Courtney, how about you? Can see, I think you might want to go to law school, huh? <laughs> I see that about you. No, I don't have the resources, the time, the money, the energy. And like Nick was saying, the work-life balance, at least at my firm, I don't see it. And what you guys will find out as you go through this program and get a job, especially at my firm, there are very few things that attorneys do that a paralegal can't do. So we obviously can't give legal advice or represent in court. But aside from that, not myself, but the senior paralegals, this one trial paralegal that we have, she does everything the attorneys do. So she gets to have that fulfillment in life without having to go through law school and spend the time and money. So law school is great, but not for me. I'm very happy with where I'm at. And Courtney, actually, uh, she interned for me. We we had an internship program. We do it still through UCI virtually. We don't do them in person. But when Courtney took, uh, she was an intern with me in person at my office but uh, again I got to know her really well and Nick as well was one of my former students and uh, and again his progression and just in the legal profession has grown by leaps and bounds and again Nick was also a student of mine in the classroom before COVID so uh, I got to know these uh, these now paralegals really well when they were students but uh, let's move on these are the hot areas of law uh, guys that um, you should keep your eye on. Again, you, some of you may be in this area now. What if you're working in a hospital, but you decide you want to do the paralegal program? There is healthcare law. You know, what if you're in, and work in uh, HR, in the, you're an HR professional, labor and employment law. So again, there is a lot of um, crossover from different areas that you may come from that you can actually wrap your legal uh, skill, skills around once you get your paralegal certificate. So just keep that in mind. And these are uh, the hot areas of law that we, especially especially data privacy. I mean, there's so much uh, people's data that's being robbed and they have to, you know, for, or held for ransom. I mean, it happened in Vegas, what, what about six months ago? And and, and uh, I think uh, MGM paid out. They paid where one of the other hotels didn't. But again, that is Legals involved in all that kind of stuff. That is an area of law, data privacy. That it, so again, there's tech. If you're a techie, there is a area of law. E-discovery and data privacy is a really wonderful area that you can go into with respect to um, learning about the law. So, what is this market like? What is the market looking like? Well, here, here's a uh, 
a LinkedIn post where you can see again, because you may think and something even uh, Courtney said, she was like, you can do everything that a, a attorney can do, but you don't have all of the, you know, the drama that comes along with it, or you don't have to tell that uh, client that you lost their case or whatever. It's like, you don't have all of that pressure, but we still get to do all of those different things besides represent a client in court. And sometimes somebody may not want to be a litigator, including myself. I don't want to litigate. There's so many other areas of law, but um, paralegals, I would say probably in the last 10 years, it was before COVID that the the, the uh, salaries were starting to increase, but paralegals can make upwards of, uh, I don't know where anyone else is, but I, and again, I know that my two senior paralegals, including myself on this call, we, we definitely make uh, close to, if not over 200K. So who would have thought a paralegal could make that much? Um, and not be an attorney, that you can make that much in the legal profession and not be an attorney. So just know that paralegal, especially as you grow in your career, you can make a really, and, and again, just a paralegal at, uh, uh, I would say three plus years, you're going to be over 100K already. That's just the norm. And again, I'm going to show you numbers here on the next slide, but I'm just telling you that. And here's a post where they're actually saying this is a Estrin Legal Services. We do work with them at UCI. If you take uh, this program, we, we have a class called Legal Career Skills, and we actually do interviews, and, and Estrin, is legal, Estrin Legal Services is one of our different uh, people that help us. But this is their post, and you can see right here, it says five years experience, a BA, and your paralegal certificate. I'm sure half of you on this call have the BA and the paralegal, and you'll have the paralegal certificate. But if you have the five years for this particular position, 125,000. And I think this one, this, I'm not sure if this one was the one with a signing bonus. I had one that had a signing bonus. I mean, it's crazy that the salaries are through the roof. Uh, these and, and here's a salary survey. The salary surveys are done by local paralegal associations as well as national paralegal associations that work locally. And this one was done by Adams and Martin. It's a legal, uh, legal sponsor um, staffing company. They do lawyers and, and uh, contract specialists and paralegals. And here are their stats with respect to the program. And again, I, I, Gave you just a, I'm giving you a, just a snippet of a 30 page document that they sent out. But you can see from Orange County to Inland County to Los Angeles to Sacramento to San Diego, but a entry level paralegal, that's a zero to four years uh, person of a case assistant, they can make upwards of 79. But look at what I was telling you about that paralegal uh, 100K is just normal. I mean, just even the, the lowest is 80K. And look at the highest. For zero to four years is a hundred over a hundred k, whereas a paralegal of four to ten years, and again that's just like the starting. It, it goes up from there. So just understand that this profession is professional. The salaries are really, um, or they're up there. They're they're doing well. So just know whether you're in the Northern California or um, or Southern California or even out of the state, because again that it depends on your state. But here in California, paralegals are paid well. So keep that in mind. So why UCI? Why UCI? Well, uh, these links are available to you because this PowerPoint will be made available to you. I'm not going to play them now, but these are the links for three different uh, of our alumni. Uh, two of them were my students. These two were former students of mine, but these are students talking about their career paths in our program. You may have already been online and already listened to their, uh, I can tell you now she's in law school. She actually grad, she was, a, she was a paralegal and worked as a paralegal for several years. She's in her last year of law school. And um, she works for Bank of America now. And she works for the city of Newport Beach. She works for the city of Newport Beach. Her, her name is Carrera. So again, all doing well. UCI spits out paralegals and they do well in their profession. Just like we are talking to you and we all have done well in our professions, but uh, UCI uh, attorneys look at our program as creme de la creme. We, we're the top notch program out of all the paralegal programs. And I think it's because it's a university level uh, program. So uh, uh, lawyers look at it and say, wow, they, we know that they got top notch education. So again, our program is ABA approved. We've, it's been around for 44 years, um, top tier public university, blah, blah, blah. We know uh, the stats on the school. If, as I was telling you, the fundamentals is the first class that you would have to take in the program. And uh, here's the face page of the class. I will be teaching it this summer. And I, I actually rotate 
the, this particular course with Vicki. Vicki will have it for the fall. I'm having it for the summer. She just had it for the spring, okay, every other quarter. Uh, so you get a flavor from two different instructors. But um, I will have it for the summer. And again, this is what the typical um, uh, screen looks like for uh, coming into the class. But here's the thing I want you to know about the fundamentals, especially if you plan to take it this summer, is um, it, uh, well, I'll let you know on the next slide when it starts, but it actually starts just so you know, on June 24th, that's when the, that's when the, it goes live as far as you have access, but the class is remote, which means, and that's something that we wanted to make sure that we had at least five, um, at least six or more classes uh, to where it's not where you are on your own and you're just doing something online. No, we're, our classes are taught like this. It's remote. We're live. You can, we, we have time with each other. You can ask the questions and, 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 and this is the way in which most, especially all of our required courses, all of the required courses are taught just like this live lectures, um, weekly or every other week. And again, the ones that are not live, for if it's a class where you're doing it every other week, just like this class, it's every other week where I teach a live lectures, 10 weeks, we're on the quarter system. So the, the, the classes run for 10 weeks and every out of the 10 weeks, five are live lectures and the other five are what, four, because of the, the, the 10th class is just review for the final exam. But the other four classes are recorded voiceover PowerPoint. So you're still hearing from me and I'm I have a voiceover PowerPoint with everything you need to know. It just wasn't live that particular week, but most of the classes are live. And that's the way all of the required courses are taught in the program, okay? Now, again, guys, uh, at this point, as we're speaking, and again, I'm gonna still bring the panel in, but if you have questions, please, please put them in the chat and we will start to answer your questions in real time, whether it's class, whether it's questions with respect to the program or questions in general for one of our panelists, start answering any questions that you have. But I think as I could get ready to go finish this PowerPoint, it will probably bring up some of the questions that you have so you'll get those answers. So I don't have any questions yet, Kai, but if you guys either... Um, if you want to post them in chat, that's fine. Or you can post them in question and answer. Um, either one of those and, and we'll get yeah, those. Yeah, either one. And Absolutely. Open. And yep. Vicki will be looking at that so we can answer those questions in real time for you. So the program itself is 30 units. Now, again, there are two type of programs we have here. We have a daytime program. It's called the compressed program. It is finished, from my understanding, and Gina, if you're on the call, you want to uh, correct me, but I, I'm sure that we well, already know it's closed for the summer. There's, I don't think there's any more openings for the cohort for the summer uh, classes. So the next one will be fall. So we're accepting applications for the fall. This is for the full-time program. The full-time is basically nine to five, Monday through Friday for three months. That It's it's um, really, and again, this same program is at UCLA, what are all the, uh, Several of the UCs have this particular paralegal program. It's all ABA approval, whatever, but you can get it done quicker. Um, and, and it's a um, three-month program, and that's called the Compressed Program. And uh, it's Monday through Friday. Um, summer, we're done taking applications, so you will be looking at the fall. Now, if you're interested in the part-time program, that's the one that we all teach in, me, Lorena, and Vicki. Um, and again, it's uh, 30 units, a variety of formats, as I was saying, is part-time evening or the compressed, which is the full-time nine to five, Monday through Friday for three months. And um, and again, the combination is live, remote, and asynchronous pre-recorded lectures. That is the way it is. We definitely have, all the instructors have at least five or six live and then uh, two or three recorded. So that's the way it is. Um, it takes anywhere from three months to a year and a half to complete the program. I've seen some students do it in about five or six months because they, they'll they'll uh, pack up and take three or four classes, especially if they want to do the part-time because they may have a full-time job, but they'll take three or four classes at one time. Uh, and we're on the quarter system, so we have classes four times a year. So they'll take those four, it'll just take them that time frame and they just pile up. I think it's crazy, but they can do it. It can be done if you want to do that. And again, here's the cost. It's approximately um, 82 to $8,300. Um, and again, we're on the quarter system. Every 10 weeks we have uh, classes. And again, our summer classes start on the um, 20. For uh, August, I can tell you now our fall classes start on the 21st of September, 20, 23rd of September. Yeah, it's that Monday, that third Monday in September. Um, 
So keep that in mind. Also, okay, with respect do you have to a couple questions? Sure, um, go ahead. Ready. Okay. So if you have a bachelor's or master's degree from another career, are there any prerequisite courses that you need, need to take before attending this paralegal program? No. Okay, that's what I thought. No. Um, if you have a further question, please ask. And then the next one is, um, does the paralegal certificate transfer between states? So if they get it at UCI here, can they take that to another state? I, and, and again, and we, you already know, Vicki, I know you can answer this too, and Lorraine and whatever. And here, here's the deal. The, the great part about you getting a paralegal program from UCI, I mean, from UCI, which is a California school, there's five states that actually have laws that govern paralegals, and California is one of them. And Arizona, Texas, what's the other ones, uh, Vicki? Arizona, Texas, California, no, Florida. Um, Florida. And there's one more. I can't think of the name of it right oh, now. I can't remember. My whole point is that, yes, you can. And it, it it weighs more power because we have laws governing us. So they know that you got the right credentialing, the right, uh, everything was taught to you appropriately. Whereas in other states, it could be a little bit willy nilly. But yes, yeah. you can take that and move on to any other okay. state. Absolutely. But again, it carries more weight because California is a state that uh, has laws governing paralegals under business and profession code 6450. Yep. This is a profession codes, in case you don't know, the codes mean laws, statutes. Those those particular laws on the business and profession codes govern all professions. So if you're a barber or a psychiatrist or a lawyer or a doctor or or a paralegal, there's laws saying what you can and cannot do in, in the state. Paralegals have laws governing what we can and cannot do in the state. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it carries more weight, definitely. Any other questions as we go? Um. I think you answered this one when the application closes. I think we already talked about that. For the compressed. For the for compressed. The compressed it, it has already closed. Matter of fact, I actually have um, this next slide even shows it. It was open from April 18th to, Mar to May 23rd. So it's closed. And that was for the summer. That was for the summer. Fall, that's why I put it in bold. Fall is what's open now. And again, the summer classes, they start on the, for the compressed starts on Monday. And they go until September the 22nd, right? So, I got more questions when you're ready. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, th there's a bunch of them coming in, so I want to get to them. What type of support does UCI provide in finding jobs after completing the program? Yes, there, there's lots of ways, including whether it be Lorena, Vicky, or I, because we are all paralegals and we, we are very well known in the industry and do all kinds of stuff. But outside of that, UCI has their own career coach with career with all kinds of career opportunities for you. Now, again, are we mandated and do we have to and all that? No. But does our program speak for itself to where job opportunities will come your way? Absolutely. Uh, Courtney, you can speak to that. Tell them, Courtney, how, uh, you know, just how going to this program can help you uh, with respect to job opportunities. What, do you, what would you say about that, Courtney? Yeah, it certainly did. That's one of the number one reasons I went to UCI because I looked in it previously and I saw they had great networking and they had a great career center, but also just putting yourself out there and getting to know people. I got to know all my professors. The one thing I wish I would have done more of, I got to know a couple of my peers, but not as many as I should have. But I really reached out to a lot of people while I was in the program and made a lot of good connections, friends of friends, anyone who's in law. Um, and that just helped immensely. Yeah. And Courtney did not only one, she did not, was it three or two internships? I did two because experience. my second one was going to be yeah. three months, but then I did it for yeah. six months. She had did, she had did two internships before and she, and that was just for her to get some experience under her belt. And it was easier for her to be able to find that first job that she's been at for six months. Yeah. All right. Keep them coming. More. Vicky. I got more. So um, this individual doesn't have a legal background. Um, they're making a career change. Um, they do have a 4.0 in the paralegal program with only three classes to go. And so many of the paralegal postings they see require paralegal experience. So how do you handle the interview in regards to having experience? Ask them, have they taken legal career skills yet? That may be one of the three classes they have left to take. Yep. And that will be talked about in there. Okay, Peggy, put, put your answer in there. Have you taken legal career skills yet? 
I'm going to move on to the next we question. We help you. And, and again, like I said, our program is on top okay. of it to where we make sure that you're ready. And, and, um, and I, I pretty much got her. She probably may have not taken it. She has not taken it yet. So oh, tell go. her just when she takes legal career skills, she will be, she and it's only a four week course, but you actually, I'll just say this quickly because I know we have more questions. When you take legal career skills, which is a four week required course, the final exam week four, you interview with real legal recruiters in the industry all over the country. Yep. That's the way the class is taught. So um, you're, you're golden. Just wait till you take that class. You'll be fine. Yeah, good. Okay, um, can the program be done at the same time while you're getting your bachelor's degree? Absolutely, we have lots of students that are in that boat right now. We're good to go. You're golden, absolutely. I did that. Yeah, lots I of, started it before I finished my bachelor's degree. Um, mm -hmm. they are at UCI many many years ago. Matter of um, fact, tell them what's the name of your bachelor's. I love when you say that. Oh gosh. Oh, my bachelor's degree. I have a um a, a, a bachelor's of science in biological sciences with a concentration in ecology and evolutionary biology. See, it's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a mouthful. And that's um, from UCI, by the way. <laughs> that's from UCI too. Are the required books available electronically? It could be. It just depends on the vendor. Some vendors do have them electronically, but I can tell you now. Uh, um. Having the book electronically does not already relate to the book that's physical. The, the page numbers could be off. The, things are always different. So yeah. I would just get the book that they, and I know the electronic book may be cheaper, but that's why, because they they fudge it. It's not the same as the actual hard copy book. Yeah, it is a little different. Um, it is different. Uh, this is an individual that went to law school, um, different country, did work as a paralegal. They're now coming, looking to want to come back into the legal industry. Um, they were out, um, you know, being a full-time mom, which is which is really great. Um, they're interested in immigration law. want to know if this program has an um, immigration law component or help them with that. No, we do not have a uh, elective in immigration, but as far as connections, yes. I mean, I can think of one now. One of my uh, dear friends, her name is Faith Nuri. Uh, and she actually is one of the guest speakers that come to speak good classes, but she uh, will be, you know, so again, whether we can do it for you or not, we have connections for you, but um, having a program that's specific to one area, no program does that for you. But again, there, there's lots of connections within immigration. And I think you'll do well. Just, I just want to speak to you personally. You will do well in here because I have, and again, I've been here almost 18 years, so I can uh, speak to this. I've had several students along the way from Brazil, uh, India. Um, I had one student, uh, one from China just two quarters ago. Uh, and what it is, is they all were lawyers in their respective countries. And they came here, whether it been with a family member or whatever, but they're here now. And again, they, they have lots of success stories of them being here and doing well uh, with the paralegal certificate. So again, you'll do fine. I got lots of testimonies for you from uh, former lawyers in their prospective countries that use the paralegal degree to help them here, per paralegal certificate. Um, another question on the compressed program. When does the fall application um, period? Start, okay, so this one, is, I'm sure it's open now. I'm not sure if you see it online. I And again, remember Gina, and, and something must have happened where she wasn't able to be here, but Gina is um, our program coordinator and she's not on the call. But again, a lot of these questions I can answer, but that particular one, I'm not sure because Gina is the one that would open up the fall. And I assume that it ha if, if it ended on May 23rd for the summer, I'm sure the fall is close to opening like in, in the next week or so. So yeah. again, keep your eye out on that, but I will let Gina follow up with whatever, whoever was on this call. I'll have her follow up with that question for you guys, to let you okay. guys know. Um, is it still possible to enroll in the part-time program for the summer? Absolutely. You can, you can enroll up to the last day. I think right now I have, I haven't looked today, but I think there's like 15 or 16 students in my fundamentals and I can take up to 40. And there's 16 now, so you're good. And again, summer is not always as packed as other quarters anyway. You know, people like to enjoy their summers. Sure. But um, yeah. but yeah, it's open still, so absolutely. Okay, Um, is the price listed for the entire program or per quarter if you go part-time? That's for the that's for the whole program. That 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 amount, 
is approximately, and again, that's kind of for books and fees and everything. That's for the whole amount. And I know, again, Gina has to speak to this because I don't deal with that. That's her her specialty area as far as all of the stuff with respect to the students. But I think there's some kind of um, um, grant or something that you can get if you need it to or what have you. But but again, that is that that pricing. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question on application, and then I'm going to go back to another question. So are references required when you're doing your application for the program? Well, um, it depends on what you're bringing to the table. If you have a bachelor's, no. Uh, if you have an associate's degree, maybe. And you have to have at least an associate's degree to even be in this program. And again, I, I will have to look at that to see if we can take That's where I kind of come in at because I'm um, one of the program directors here. So um, yeah, but but again, if you have a bachelor's, no, you're golden. Okay. And then um, another individual with no legal background and wants to know what kind of advice um, we have for introducing them to the field of law before they're actually committing to the program, if they're volunteer opportunities or anything like that, or should they just try to enroll in the program and, and go with that? And I have well, a great you answer to that. Take that talk one? to your mom. You should go talk Lorena, to your mom. Lorena, you want to take that one? <laughs> Yes. Hi. Um, you know what? I would say for that one, I mean, you can go either way, but maybe just go with your gut first. Um, I will tell you, so if you want to just enroll in the program, then enroll in the program. But I will tell you that some of the opportunities that are almost always available from what I know is either, and it pertains to criminal law, is either in the DA's office or the public defender's office. They always have internship programs available. They're not paid. That's why they're always available. But I will say if you at least want to get a little bit of a taste of just law in general, you can always take a look at their websites there. Yeah. And I'm sure they'd be happy to to take somebody yeah, that might not on, and also along them. those lines, the legal aid community, uh community, uh community, that's what's called now, right? Legal aid community. And also Veterans Legal Institute. I mean, there's so many different nonprofits uh, in our profession that you can go and work and get hands-on training if that's something that you wanted to do as well, whether while you're in the program or before you come in the program or whatever. But you you can be the greenest paralegal. And again, Courtney, I'm coming back to you. Courtney was one of my students, but again, she had she had computer skills. She knew she was a writer. She she had great attention to detail. Those are things that we all have, right? You know, she could, she, you know, she could write a sentence, right? But I'm talking about, but she had great writing skills. But my whole point is that she had no legal experience. Nada. Right, Courtney? Right. Look at her now. And again, that's, and I guess my, my whole point of letting all you guys know on the call, you don't have to be equipped before you come in the program. Come as you are. And you will do well. And again, core, that's why I bring certain students in on these calls. I want I don't want all senior level paralegals talking about their career. I want you to hear from people from all levels of their career so you can see that it's possible. Anything to add to that, Courtney? Yeah, I mean, if I can do it, anyone can. Because what Kai <laughs> left out there... Not only did I not have any legal experience, I really didn't have any career experience. I had been at home with my children for 15 years. I was really interested in law and really motivated. I knew I had the capacity to do it and do it well. And like I said, I made the most of getting to know my professors and the other peers and something else to be said about this program. I know right now, pretty much the panelists are talking, but when you're in class, um, I went through the program where it was just online. I know some of these other panelists went in person. I did do the one that was fully online after COVID. But when you're in class, you have a lot of opportunities to talk to the other people, um, the other students, and the teachers, the professors really encourage that. I also highly recommend after every class, I think every single one of my professors always made time. Stick around if you have questions, you want to discuss an assignment, anything at all. They put themselves out there. I always did, always, every single time. So they're really open to that. So it's a lot more interactive than I know right now. This is more of an informative session and we're trying to answer your questions, but the classes, they've really encouraged that more. And so you'll be able to network with people. And that's what I did. That's how I got to know the law a little better and know more people that were involved in different areas. And that's something important that Courtney said, even though this is this whole program is virtual, it's live virtual, just like we are now. But 
think about that in the classroom where you had that that teacher and you could stay behind and talk to them about the class or whatever. We still do that virtually. We still lean in. We still have office hours. It's there, guys. And again, she's the testament to that. Yeah. Okay. One more. And this is, okay. I think, this is relevant to everybody. And, and I think this goes beyond um, the program itself, but just life in general right now. But it's in particular for the students. How can they go about, like, how does networking and getting to know their peers and professors work well with the fully remote environment? And what advice do we have uh -huh. for students? That's, I know we're all laughing because we, we uh, the Orange County, and I'm going to let Nick finish this one off. The Orange County Paralegal Association. Again, think about San Diego Paralegal Association, Los Angeles Paralegal Association, San Francisco. All of the major cities in California have paralegal associations and they do live events. We just had, and I'm laughing because we just had one last night where we had a labor and employment lawyer come talk at the local um, Hilton Hotel in Costa Mesa. We had over 60 people come. We had a bunch of paralegals. We had legal vendors. We hobnob with each other. We do these events. We we exchange business cards. We talk to each other about all this. And, and again, Nick, tell them about the national conference that we're about to go to in three weeks. Um, so NALA is the National Association of Legal Assistance, which is similar to like the Orange County Paralegal Association, but it's across all 50 states. And I think the perk to networking there is, as some of the people on this call, hire paralegals. They've got job openings. They know people that have job openings in all different kinds of fields. And so if you really are interested in networking, getting to know people, everybody's super nice. But at the same time, everybody does this every day. I've come to Kai with questions about forming corporations before. And so as you start to network and do this, um, it does get easier as you do it. But Kyle recommends somebody else, that person will recommend somebody else, and eventually you can get to exactly where you want to be, where you feel comfortable being. So networking is, I would say, 90%. Absolutely. And guys, think about it for lawyers. What do lawyers get all of that? And they hobnob with each other. We're at the Orange County Bar, the National mm -hmm. Bar Association, the ABA, ABA, the Bar Association. Um, same thing with paralegals. We do it at our local level paralegal association. Our paralegal association in Orange County, we have over 600 members and we do all kinds of different things. And, and again, paralegals, and I, I want to, because I know you guys have to go and I want to be respectful of your time. So this, we're about to wrap it up, but just understand paralegals. You'll learn this when we have the class, if you plan on uh, signing up for the program, paralegals in California, just like attorneys have to have continuing education. That is why we really hobnob with each other. That meeting we had last night, that was worth one hour of ethics credit. We, we have to get continuing education, just like doctors and, and, and nurses have to get continuing education. We have to be on top of the laws regarding the profession, just like lawyers. Lawyers have to have 25 hours every three years. Paralegals have to have eight hours every two years. So again, we out there, we're hobnobbing with each other. We're doing this. And um, and again, it, it's uh, very successful. And the paralegal program at UCI has been successful. And, um, and I hope that you decide to join our paralegal program and we would love to have you. And if so, I will see you in my class on the 20, well, the live, the first live lecture will be that same week, the 27th, that Thursday, uh, the 27th of June is the first live lecture, but the class starts on the 24th. So I hope to see you there. And uh, again, I wanna be respectful of you guys' time and also the, the panelist time. So we wanna end this call, but if you have any follow-up questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'm just gonna leave my email and it's really easy. It's Kai, that's my first name, K-A-I at uci.edu. And I'm sorry, Kai W, my, my last letter, but Kai, K-A-I-W at uci.edu. Thank you so much. Take care.